We talk about male power. What are we talking about? Usually people, when they think about male power, they think about all the men who are legislators, all the men who are the heads of corporations, and they think men have all the power. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that power is control over your life. And if you feel obligated from when you're a boy to get a job that earns more, even if you don't like it as much, and then you end up dying sooner, I'm saying to men, that's not control over your own life. Mm. I'm saying to men that if a woman, if we said to a woman, you know, why don't you have influence over 14 children? Have 14 children, then you'll have more influence, you'll have more power. Then we would say, I, I won't have more power, I'll have more work. Uh -huh. But we say to men, you know, why don't you supervise 14 people rather than one people, then one person, then you'll have more power. Men say, oh, okay, you do. Well, uh, is power yeah, tied to money? Well, power is tied to the ability to control one's life, and if you earn more money, at something that you don't like to do in order to get other people to, in order to provide for other people like the children or your wife and not to provide for what you want to do for fulfillment, then that's not power. That's serving others. That's a good thing to do, but it's not power. It's not control over your own life. So what we've, what, because women's role has historically been biological and men's role has been social, we've had to give men social incentives to do what men would not otherwise have chosen to do. So we give men medals to die in war. We give men special honors to play football, smash face. If we tell women, you know, go out and get male approval by getting concussions, playing smash mm -hmm. face with each other, or getting spinal cord injuries, no one would have difficulty recognizing that as the subsidizing of child abuse in the name of education. Mm -hmm. But when we subsidize boy abuse in high school, we all go out and we applaud for it. You know, we, with the same thing, if we were doing that for women, we would abhor it. Now, uh, the view currently is that we live in a male-dominated society. At least that's the headline. Mm -hmm. Who's been putting out that headline, and is it true? Well, everyone's been putting it out, because men have brought the belief that, that earning more money that someone else spends is dominance. Um, in Japan, for example, which we think of as the quintessential male-dominated society, the Japanese boys are trained by education mamas to go to the right kindergarten, the right first grade, and right on through to college. Mm -hmm. And they learn very early that no woman will want them if they are not a, a, a salaried man. And so, and if they are a, fa a man who doesn't provide for a woman has always been either ostracized or ignored whether it's been the gay man, the Native American Indian man, who was very revered when he was providing for women. But as soon as we conquered the Native Americans and we confined them to the reservations of their defeat, mm. uh, they, were beca they became the laughing stock and they became ridiculed. Black men who didn't perform for women became the laughing stock. And now since we've gotten divorces and white middle-class American men don't take care of women for a lifetime, they've become the subject of male bashing. Um, you say that men are the disposable sex? Mm -hmm. How so? In a number of different ways. They're disposable in part as fathers. When there's a divorce um, and the woman says, I want full custody over the child, it's almost impossible for the man to get custody over that child. So he's, he, is, he serves the interest of being the child's wallet. Uh, he, might be, he might be sued for um, paying child support, but he doesn't have, oftentimes he doesn't even have rights to visitation. He's a disposable sex in the sense that 94% of the men who die at work in the hazardous jobs, uh, the people who die at work, 94% of them are men. He's disposable in the sense that 15 of the leading causes of death all are subject to men dying sooner than women. Um, in 1920, I was fascinated to, to know that in 1920, men used to only die one year sooner than women do. Mm -hmm. In 1990, we die seven years sooner. Hold on that note, if you would. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Warren Farrell is our guest, and uh, he's been around this uh, business of uh, men's movements and women's movements for a long time now. Uh, about 20 years ago, he was in the forefront uh, with one book, a new book now, called The Myth of Male Power. There it is on the screen right now. We're going to continue our conversation about the roles of men and women, and this is America.
chair and to hold the boy in dance position and with the woman leading in the dance position. <laughs> and have the woman stand on the chair and experience what it's like to be in a more powerful position, in a stand-up position. And men often say, you know, well, gee, I, I found myself feeling more overpowered. And in fact, when a woman came down and kissed me, my, my neck was hurting because I was having to, you know, lean up to, to be kissed by her. Um, so it just, it's the beginning of helping people understand what it's like to be in the other sex's shoes. Hold me, Look up, look up, you know. Like she had control over the situation, which it isn't supposed to be. I mean, she was... Now, uh, that uh, tape was done how long ago? That tape was done, I guess, about eight or nine years ago on Real People. Okay, so you were talking about uh, reversal of roles? I, I, one of my main goals is to get the sexes to understand each other by getting them to walk a mile emotionally in the other sex's moccasins. Okay. So I have every man in my workshops um, try to understand issues like sexual harassment, for example, by having every man not only put through a, a beauty contest, in which the women are the judges and the men are the the judges, um, and but every man, of course, in that beauty contest loses, gets rejected, except for the winner. And so, what the men begin to understand is the love-hate relationship that a lot of women have with their bodies, and they begin to sort of feel like um, what it's like to be objectified. Conversely, a lot of times we hear when we talk about sexual harassment issues or date rape issues mm -hmm. that men have the power, that men ask the women out. And so I have all the women reverse roles and ask the men out. And the men play a little bit hard to get. And the women are all sweating and they feel not powerful, but they feel powerless. And suddenly women get it that ask, being expected to ask out somebody else who you're not sure whether or not they like you does not feel powerful. It feels very um, undermining almost. Mm -hmm. um, you, you suggested that the way it works in America is that, that men and women have various roles that mm -hmm. they play, they mm -hmm. act out, right? Go ahead. Th th they still do, even though we pretend not to. For example, it's very rare that a woman will feel comfortable marrying a man who's earning considerably less than she does. Mm -hmm. if, he, if she meets a warm, tender, open, loving guy who's reading, I'm okay, you're okay, on the unemployment line, mm -hmm. uh, or driving a cab, and he's single, but he has a master's degree in anthropology and is a fascinating person. Uh, when I've taken cabs with feminists even, and we've met men like that, never have I seen a feminist ask that man for his phone number, even if he's single, even if he's a fascinating person to talk with. Uh, she sees him as invisible in terms of eligible for love. So what you're suggesting is that the primary consideration uh, of a woman in uh, evaluating a man is that they are a success. Is that well, correct? Yes. Well, yes. Or at least on the way to becoming a success? Yes, he, he, she, that's a prerequisite. Now, it's not the only thing she wants. Every woman wants a man who's sensitive, who listens, who has common values, who has a sense of humor, who has warmth, and all those things. Um, and many women have turned down men who are very successful, who have very few of those things. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the medical doctor has a lot more of what I call the slack factor from a woman. If a medical doctor acts a little bit arrogant or overbearing or authoritarian, um, and the woman is going out with him, he'll give him a lot more leeway than she will, say, a, um, um, a man who's a grocery store checkout clerk or a man who is a but yet very, uh, or, or a cab driver, or somebody who is um, an elementary school teacher even. Mm -hmm. uh, you have said that in uh, things like uh, war, uh, suicide, uh, the death professions, and I want you to talk about that, health issues, longevity, and net worth, men are all on the bottom. Yes, that's what, what I call men's glass cellars. Just like we have the glass ceilings that women are um, prevented from getting into, we have men encouraged into taking professions like uh, all the dangerous professions like logging and trucking. Whenever you see a trucker, you're, t you're looking at somebody who is, has one of the highest possibilities of any occupational group of dying. But don't men just gravitate there, uh, uh, Warren, because uh, th they're more physical jobs and uh, that's suited more for a man than a woman? They're, they're, um, certainly, that's part of the reason, but there's a much deeper reason. If you, go, if you take any cab, and any woman as well as any man practically can drive, mm -hmm. um, and you ask the cab driver, what was his goal in his early life? 
and he'll tell you oftentimes I wanted to write or I wanted to do this and something adventurous, something creative. And we say, well, what led you to drive in a cab? He'll usually say something like, well, I got married and I had a couple of children mm -hmm. and this job didn't go quite so well. Mm -hmm. And so I took this job and how, how many hours a week are you working? 50, 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. This is a job that either sex could do. But Isn't it fairly new that uh, in a situation where there are more working mothers that there's more of a split in uh, people kicking in? Uh, and, and pulling two salaries to make things work? To some degree, and that's taken some of the pressure off of some men. Um, but basically speaking, once, um, once men and women have children together, men still produce over 80% of the household income. One of the reasons that men produce, do such a small percentage of the housework and child care is because they do only 25-30% of the housework and child care, but in part is because they're working many more hours outside the home this is women are working many more hours inside the home. Mm -hmm. When we add all those things together, we, we have men on the average working 61 hours per week outside, uh, outside and inside the home together, women working 56 hours per week outside and inside the home. So the image that we have of the sort of the, the deadbeat dad that comes home and does nothing, it misses the point that on the average, the full-time working man works much more outside the home than even the full-time working woman. And overall, especially when they have young children, the man is much more likely still to work outside the home. So you're saying, contrary to the messages that have been coming our way for the last uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, you're saying it's the men who are oppressed. Yes? Well, I'm saying that neither sex has been oppressed. I'm saying that both sexes historically were, were not oppressed by anybody. Both sexes historically were much more enslaved to the, the real dominant group and the real dominant group was not a person, it was the needs of survival. For, hundred, for thousands of years, men, women were told, women, you will be ostracized if you don't risk your life bearing children and spend your life raising children. Mm -hmm. Men were told, you will be ostracized if you don't take on a woman and children, marry her and raise the money. So men, women were told, raise children, men were told, raise money. That's okay. both sexes slated into roles. Neither sex had power, both sexes had roles. Both sexes had obligations. Power is when you have the ability to control your life, not when you do what you're programmed to do. All that having been said, what would you like to see changed? I'd like to see a lot of things change. One is I'd like to see a man and a woman sit down. Uh, first of all, even as, let's say they have the option of starting this when they're dating. Um, I'd like to talk to men about uh, when you and a woman sit down, and it's the first date, and the check comes, and she disappears to the lady's room. Understand that that's the clearest single message. If she doesn't volunteer with you to share the check, or to pick it up this time, and you pick it up the next time, or vice versa, that there's a message there that she is interested in her money as her money, but your money becomes spent on her when it's the two of you spending something together. In other words, she's expecting some, she in, feels entitled to you taking care of her. So what do you want the man to do? I want the man to have the, this internal security, to be willing to lose that woman's affection by asking her to either share or to say, can I pick up the check this time and maybe you can pick it up next time? Mm -hmm. And so that he's saying right from the outset that, th that I don't want to be subsidizing you to have three options, the option of being full-time involved with the children, the option of being involved with the home, or the option of doing some combination of both, well, well, if we get married and we have children, I have three different options. Option one is work full time. Option one is two is work full time. And option three is work full time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of men, once there are children that occur, they start saying to themselves, okay, I have to earn the money. And I'm saying men cannot expect women to hear what men do not say. And as of this point in history, women can't be expected to hear men because we haven't done our homework. We haven't seen all the discrimination that is out there. That we, we hear things about health issues and we say you know, the health issue, the, the women's health is more um, discriminated against than men's health. I, Not true. I think you said uh, if you took a look at uh, breast cancer or cancer of the prostate mm -hmm. uh, that there were some parallel uh, numbers uh, but uh, all the focus seems to be on, uh, on the breast, breast cancer, cancer and the research and I'm a very strong supporter of research for breast cancer mm -hmm. and research for all female health. Mm -hmm. And yet I also ask us to look at, to be inclusive rather than exclusive and recognize that 
almost as many men die of prostate cancer as women do of breast cancer, and that we, that we have 660% as much research allocated to female breast cancer as we do to male prostate cancer. Uh, men, uh, you said the net worth of women is higher than the net worth of men. Mm -hmm. I gather that's tied in with the longevity factor, huh? No, it's actually tied in with the fact that men have more spending obligations. So men do have higher gross incomes okay. as a result of working more hours and a bunch of other things. All right. Um, but men, for example, a man and a woman get divorced, let's say, and a man is much more likely to be paying money for a mortgage on a home that he doesn't live in. As a result, he also has to pay money out to rent his own apartment, let's say. He also is more likely to be paying child support, more likely to be paying alimony. Oh, I thought you were talking about the fact that, that women live longer and, and they get left a uh, certain amount of money they're around to enjoy. Well, that's one of the ways. Insurance. That's, that's one of the ways through insurance, social security, and longevity that women do end up with. Why higher, do women live uh, longer than men? Well, for a number of reasons. One is it's important to know that in 1920 they only lived one fewer, one more year than men did. Yes. Because that helps us understand that it's not all biological, uh, which most people assume it is. Um, breech birth techniques that were developed in the 20s and 30s helped women not die as frequently in childbirth. But I think the real reason that men live, uh, women live so much longer than men, is that since the Industrial Revolution, since 1920s and on men have increasingly been doing the jobs outside the home that have been supplying the better homes and gardens for women, the better washing machines, the central heating, the air conditioning, mm. uh, the, the um, serums that um, cured both men's and women's health. But their jobs outside the home often brought them away from the, work, the, away from the place of love. Mm. And men have often felt like the family's wallets. Are the women who are watching the show right now saying, uh, that guy better get a grip? I mean, really, I mean, he's, he's just off the deep end. Well, actually, a lot of women, once, and sometimes when you first hear these things, it, it, they sort of like, what, I, this isn't so outrageous in relation to what I was, when I was on the board of NOW in New York City. Yes, you were on the board. I, I was saying for years that men had the power, and I, because I didn't know these other pieces of information, I started asking myself, it's fascinating that when we compare blacks and whites, blacks die sooner than whites do, and we recognize that one of the reasons is that blacks have less power. We recognize that, and that the groups that have more power really commit more suicide. And I started to, to wonder, why is it that not only men commit suicide, if we have all the power, why are we also the suicide sex? And why is it that men commit suicide at the age of 85, 1,350% as much as women do at the age of 85, and yet we say, men have the power. There's something else going on here. And even though I was doing very well financially, speaking on behalf of the women's movement, I had, my integrity said to me, I have to look at something more. The whole, the whole picture is not being included here. Born in New York City, you? Yes. And uh, tell me a little bit about your family, your dad and your mom, and dad, what you were learning from them on the way up. You know, my dad was an accountant, and I saw him work very hard. My mom worked very hard at home. With, we had, she had two children for a while, and then when I was 13, had a third um, son. Um, Wayne, um, I saw, uh, I think it was impactful for me that um, my mother had uh, died um, after going through some bouts of depression. I was never quite sure whether she committed suicide or whether she died as a result of something else that was more accidental. And so when the women's movement came along and I had heard my mother talking about things like the importance of being able to have her own source of income and being able to, sp to spend the way she wanted to spend without having to go like a welfare recipient to my dad, all that made real sense to me, and I supported the women's movement very strongly. But then later in my life, as I also began to see things like, uh, I saw my brother Wayne um, go um, mountain climbing, cross-country skiing, uh, with his woman friend, and he, uh, he walked out in front of his woman friend to check out an area that they both knew was dangerous. They didn't both go out together. He went out and checked out the danger. An avalanche came along and buried him 40 feet under, mm -hmm. and I, started asking myself, why did we automatically assume, why did he automatically assume that he had to do that alone? How do men and women both play into this assumption that if there's a robber in the house, the man gets out of bed and he checks it out. They don't both go out of bed and both check it out. And I started beginning to say, is this power to expose yourself to death so frequently and to expect your lifespan to be, to be at jeopardy, to be in a sense the disposable sex? Mm. Uh, almost like the bodyguard? 
Yes, actually, in, in many ways, and I, I, you know, I'm saying all this, but you know, I'm not being honest myself. I remember a few some years ago, I'm walking in the woods with a woman friend, and somebody jumped out from the woods and into our path, and within a tenth of a second, I jumped in front to protect the woman. The woman jumped back to be to be protected. But maybe that's and the natural instinct, huh? It probably is a natural instinct, and these instincts for women to choose men who are protectors means was functional for thousands of years. That's what we did to survive. But what I'm saying in, in the myth of male power is that for the first time in human history, choosing men who are protectors who can kill used to lead to survival of the fittest. Now with nuclear technology, choosing the killer protector male will eventually lead to the destruction of everyone. And historically speaking, choosing a man who could protect a woman was what a woman learned to call love. I'm now saying that love requires not the killer protector male, but the nurturer co connector male. And men need to be encouraged to connect and nurture rather than develop the, feel the lack of feelings, the lack of value of self and the lack of self-esteem that comes with automatically assuming that he has to risk his life to be a woman's bodyguard. So, uh, 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 men, uh, we have to do some learning, some serious learning, that's what you're saying. The next step is totally up to men. We can't expect women to hear what we don't say, and we cannot. And therefore, we have to do the reading. We have to be informed as to why it is that that we're dying sooner of all 15 leading causes of death, and we have to and we have to have the courage to speak up to women about these issues. Uh, schooling at uh, NYU and UCLA, mm -hmm. uh, political science. Political science, yes. Uh, and then you've taught at a bunch of places, uh, political science and psychology and all. I taught at the School of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego, mm -hmm. to Georgetown and Was uh, American University here. And then back 20 years ago, you wrote Liberated Man. Mm -hmm. And then 86, Why Men Are the Way They Are, mm -hmm. which was translated into a bazillion languages, right? <laughs> yes. All over the world. Mm -hmm. So you have been, and you've kind of slipped it in a couple of times and kind of hit it over the head one more time, uh, in New York City, you were on the board of the National Organization of Women, right? In New York City, correct. Yeah. And uh, so you were articulating a feminist point of view. And I still agree mm -hmm. with every one of the original tenets of feminism, which is that, A, I want men and women to have the chance to rethink their roles rather than be in, in neutral straitjackets, and B, I want both sexes to have options, not obligations. And so I'm very supportive of the portions of feminism that lead to female empowerment. I'm very opposed to the portions of feminism that develop victimhood as a fine art, uh, that encourage women to sort of think of a dirty joke as sexual harassment, and not, do not encourage women to sort of look at, at what's happening in the larger context of the workplace, uh, that, that, that encourage women to uh, do things that are leading to the U.S. Air Force finding recently that 27% of the women who had accused men of rape eventually acknowledged by their own accord that they had lied about that for a reason. Uh, you talk about intimacy and romance in uh, relationships as uh, the men see it as something they do, the women see it as something that is done to them, huh? Yes, to some degree. And what I'm saying to men is that we have to stop paying for intimacy. We have to, and, and because we, when we assume that we're the ones that pay for intimacy and pay for sexuality, we start going off and producing money. And producing money usually takes us away from the women that we love. So the things that we do to get love, like succeeding, take us away from love. And that becomes the male catch-22. One of the things that happens in America is that no one pays men to love. Warren Farrell has, uh, is our guest, and uh, his book, uh, The Myth of Male Power, there it is on the screen right now. Uh, you can see it. Uh, it's going to be a big, big book because uh, the reviews of it already uh, have uh, been so intriguing, inviting people to uh, get involved in a very, very important conversation. Take a little break right now. Back on the other side for a closing comment from our guest, Dr. Warren Farrell. Oh, we have so much to talk about, hostility and victims and so on and so forth, but I want to put one word on the table for you to run with. Mm -hmm. uh, commitment for men and women in relationships. What does that word commitment mean? It means committing yourself to listening rather than just talking, uh, committing yourself to, um, to a constant involvement in making sure that your partner feels that they have a safe environment to be 
to have the most negative feelings that they have expressed. Because when both people feel that someone else understands them, I've never had a couple come to me and say, Warren, I want a divorce. My partner understands me. Mm -hmm. Needs. We all have needs, right? Mm -hmm. And we really need each other, don't we as well? We need each other enormously. And this should be a period in history rather, rather, that rather than talking about victimhood, we should be celebrating that we have the opportunity for a new definition of love that we've never had in history before. Not love based on roles, divided roles that led to divided interests, but overlapping roles that lead to overlapping interests. Are you a voice crying in the wilderness, or do you see other people kind of following along? I think there's a lot of people out there that feel the way I do about this. So you're hopeful? I really am hopeful, yes.